The Major Spoilers podcast covers news, reviews, and of course, spoilers, and goes into details about the topics discussed. So if you haven't read, listened, or watched the items we talk about, you might want to come back later. Welcome to the Major Spoilers podcast. Thank you for downloading and checking us out this week. And oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, you notice that this isn't your normal Major Spoilers podcast. And that is because I am currently at a soccer game. For many of you who have been listening for years, the boy is now a senior in high school. You're welcome. (laughs) I know many of you are like, oh, no, I'm old. Yes, you're welcome. But uh, you know that from a very young age, he has been playing soccer. And this is his senior year in soccer. And my goal is to make it to as many of his home games as we can. Well, I'm going to make it to all of his home games because he's my son and I want to support him. And I know you do, too. Let me just brag on him for just one moment. Last week, last weekend, we had, um, or I guess all of last week, uh, one of the competing cities had a tournament. His high school was part of that tournament. They got second overall. They lost to the hosting uh, tournament uh, team. But um, of the three games that they played, five goals were made overall. He made three of those goals. And he was on the all-tournament team. So, yeah, I'm mighty proud of this kid as he's grown into a fine young adult. And I plan on seeing all of his home games this year, which means this week, September 17th, 2024. Hello, future people. uh, I am at a soccer game. The next time that we have a home soccer game that will interrupt the recording of this show uh, will be on October 15th. That's senior night. So all the parents get to go out and stand with their kids. And it looks like that's it. I don't see anything else currently listed on the calendar. Although the league and regional and state tournaments are not listed on these dates. So that could cause a conflict. But right now for this season, a lot of away games. So it only looks like one other episode is going to be impacted by soccer home games. Unfortunately, because of my younger son and my work and everything. And the fact that these other cities that we play are often two hours, sometimes more away. I can't go to all of his away games, which is unfortunate. But fortunately, those games stream so I can watch them there uh, as well. So what are we going to do this week? Well, I promised you last week we were going to do Sleeping Beauties from Stephen King. I've moved that to later in the year. So don't worry, we'll get to that. Uh, But we are going to do a Stephen King retro podcast where we're going to go deep into our archives all the way from 2010. Here's our discussion of Stephen King's The Dark Tower, Gunslinger Reborn. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. With those those words, we are introduced to the world of Roland Deschain. Deschain? How do you say that, Rodrigo? Deschain. Deschain and the world of Dark Tower. Stephen King wrote the original, what, seven books over the course of 30 years? Marvel came along and said, hey, Stephen King, we like your stuff. We're doing your Stan series. How about you let us take a crack at the Dark Tower? And so they gave the assignment to. Yeah, I think this came before the Stan. So they gave the assignment to Peter David and he said, hey, why don't you tell an original story that leads us in to the Dark Tower series? Prequel. Prequel, if you will. Rodrigo, give us a breakdown of. uh, who the gunslinger is, and um, yeah, just give us a breakdown of who the gunslinger is, or what are the gunslingers. All right, so the Dark Tower takes place in in a world <laughs> where um, it's kind of it's a fantasy world, only instead of um, sword and sorcery, it's gun and sorcery. Right. Um, you know, whereas in other stories you have knights and and rogues and stuff like that. Here you mostly have cowboys and desperados and silverados and things like that <laughs> coronado coronados and el dorado <laughs> um, the uh this is the story of roland who becomes a gunslinger at you know once he uh hits puberty he embarks in this quest he um has to def- defeat his mentor 
and earn the right to carry a six shooter because they're these things aren't plentiful. They're you know kind of ancestral weapons for all intents and purposes. Right. Um, he, um, we are introduced to a bad bad man who is sleeping with his mom. Um, and he, that guy works for the Crimson King, who is an even badder man. Um, and um, Roland kind of uh, takes off on a quest to. Actually, I forget what exactly the quest is for. Well, but um, I guess eventually he's going to try to bring down the Crimson King, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay, but, but I believe he's sent out uh, to get horses, right? Yeah, this one it's kind of a um, spy mission where he and his friends are sent to this town in the guise of tabulating what kind of resources the kingdom has, mm-hmm. how many horses, how many bread baskets, how many all of these things. And under the guise that they're going to procure horses for the battle against the evil forces. All the while, they are secretly there trying to find spies. Spies. And in the process, they discover the they discover the spies. Roland falls in love. Some fighty fighty ensues. Cthulhu shows up. Cthulhu shows up, yes, at the end. Um and it's you know, and the story progresses. You find about these magic balls. Yes, magic balls. The, in this one, it's the pink. It's the pink ball that yep, apparently the allows you to or see. Like that. Yeah, the pink grapefruit or whatever that apparently allows you to see what's going on. Mer- Merlin's these, grapefruit. Yeah. There are all of these rainbow balls that are floating around, and I guess uh, the Crimson King is trying to collect them all. Creepy guy, big old spider guy, yeah, spider monster guy. Here's here's the thing that he's pretty much the devil. Yes, he is with a face like that. Um, here's the thing that surprised me about this book. Now, I have been aware of Stephen King's uh, The Dark Tower series for a long time. Mm-hmm. Always saw it when I'd go through the fantasy section, Dark Tower, and I'd see this cowboy. And back in the day, I was anti anything western. Now I'm not so much that way. Um, but I always avoided this. Everybody said it was such a long series that it, you know, took forever to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was, you know, at that time, I think there were only three books out, uh, when I was first, uh, encountering it. And I, so I just generally avoided it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then after reading this, I'm like, well, this is interesting because, and this is a discussion that Rodrigo had and Matthew, please jump in. Um, this takes place in my opinion, in a post-apocalyptic world. A world where something has happened, I say nuclear bomb, bombs, uh, partly because of the art that we see of older things look kind of melty, and that could just be the art style of, uh, what's his name, Jay Lee, Jai Lee. Um, Jay Lee. But then we also are introduced to this um, mutations of horses and animals and people, some of these mutations giving people the power of sight, of touch, of whatever. Uh, also creates these fantastical creatures. But then the big reveal that the boys discover is that the bad people of this town that they've gone to secretly have these World War II looking tanks and they're taking oil and they're turning it into gasoline to fuel the machines Mm -hmm. so that they can go against the king. Uh, And Roland is the son of the king. Uh, And defeat him in the name of the Crimson King. And they defeat those bad guys, et cetera, et cetera. Like I said, Roland falls in love with a girl. Mm-hmm. And as tragedy would have it, she gets killed. She does. Last thing you see All is her right. getting killed. Old witch style. Yep. The old witch, however, makes it. Yes, she does. Matthew, do you get the same impression? Is this a post-apocalyptic world? Has to be. Because Why? it combines... For me, it's kind of like the theory of the Flintstones. In the future, the Flintstones have rebuilt society as it existed circa 1960 AD. This future society has cowboys who are also kind of knights, who are also kind of, you know, mysterious driftery types. It combines all these different elements into one. And I think that Mm -hmm. what's happened is in this, in this world that, you know, has moved on, Whatever has happened, and the whatever isn't important, but whatever has happened has caused them to rebuild using the trappings of several different iterations of society. And that's, I think that's one of the draws for me. 
Rodrigo, but you don't you didn't see it that way, did you? No, I didn't see it as a as a post apocalyptic world. I just see it as a I, I suppose if you have to put it someplace, it's it's more of an alternate reality or an alternate past where certain things would have developed faster than others. Oh, okay. So you have guns alongside the feudal code. Right. Kind of things. And, right. And, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of what's in the Dark Tower is there largely to sound cool. You know, they have, like, the katet and, and, and things like right, that and all right. this other stuff that sounds super awesome. But in the end, they could just say, you know, they the th- were friendships. Yeah, the three amigos. Yes. Um, and sometimes I think if you get uh, hung up on the their speech patterns and nomenclature and, and, and stuff like that, it it seems like, you know, you, you might think, like, where do these people come from? Because it's, like, it's half um, Asian mysticism, or, like, it's a little bit of Asian mysticism, a little bit of cowboy, a little bit of, you know, feudal... Uh, Europe, right. you know, things like that. But I think what it is is it is this hodgepodge and rather than necessarily it taking place sometime along our own timeline, it's basically Stephen King just saying, oh, this sounds cool, this sounds cool, this sounds cool. I'm going to build a world around it. It's kind of mm-hmm. like how clerics in D&D are basically Christian um, right. holy men, you right. know, from the Crusades, but they worship different gods and live in a polytheistic society. Right. It's just an aspect that seemed interesting applied to something else. And the Dark Tower is basically 10,000 things that seemed interesting applied Mm -hmm. to something else. Now, Matthew, you have mentioned before that you really like Stephen King. Have you read the original Dark Tower source material? I really like Stephen King's short stories. Mm -hmm. I really like Stephen King with a word limit, and I feel that there's a point where Stephen King's work kind of outstrips itself it it and i mean this in a nice way his creativity is like a tumor it just goes and it grows and there comes a point where it's just so big that your whole head falls over and the dark tower is the biggest of the big Uh, for instance it was about 400 pages too long for me um my college roommate carl uh, loved Stephen King and loved the Dark Tower series and really, really, really wanted me to read it. And I think partly because I was an ass to Carl, <laughs> I've never actually read the Gunslinger books. And the one time that I tried, I just I had my Tolkien experience again where I was just like, my gosh, this is dragging. They walked and they walked and they walked and Roland burned his fingers on the bullets and then he forgot the face of his father and the blah, blah, blah. And I just and like, does anybody have a myself. picture of my dad? I've forgotten his exactly. face. Exactly. <laughs> we got tanks, but we don't have Polaroids. What the hell? And he was momentarily Jewish for no reason. Nobody knows why. Well, uh, but, you know, I agree with you on, <laughs> on your assessment of Stephen King because... When I was younger, I picked up, I think I saw It, uh, it was one of those, It or or something, and I read through it, and I got to the end, and I was like, man, they killed a big spider with a rock. Yep. And then I read Tommyknockers, and it's like, uh, they defeated the aliens, and then literally in two pages, the government came in and cleaned up all the aliens, and that was the end. And I read The Stand, and it was like, oh, so the mental patient walks into the town with a nuclear bomb in the end. And Stephen King, you're right, has a great buildup of story, well, and then boop. A, a, a huge, a fantastic example, and and you know this is this is a story, this is a, a movie that kind of changed movies. It's one of it's a pivotal movie. Carrie, mm-hmm. the the final scene, yeah. the most memorable, well, this possibly the second most memorable thing about that movie, where the girl has that dream that she goes to see her, and the hand comes out and grips her. Right. Not in the original book. Yeah. As I'm, from what I'm told, mm-hmm. that was added on because the story does just like, and then this happened, the end. Yeah. So it needed yeah. that that second shock, that little bit of denouement at the end yeah. that Stephen King just never gives you, mm-hmm. even in the movies. You know, because the only time I've seen, I've experienced Stephen King is in movies. I always, I was always disappointed by it. I was disappointed by Tommy Knockers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't. I just at, when I finished Christine reading Tommy Knockers, has an ending, but I think that's more John Carpenter too. Yeah, mm-hmm. when I read Tommy Knockers, I was like, "That's the last time I'm ever reading Stephen King," because I was so psyched for that and stopped reading it. So, uh, 
having something that was Cowboy and Stephen King, and there were only three nice. volumes of a yet unfinished series, was oh, like, yeah. no thank you. So I guess, since none of us have ever read the original source material, we can't really comment on how well this translates. Now, this right. is a prequel, obviously. Sure we this can. We're jackasses document. like that. We can probably ask Rob. I'm pretty sure he's read plenty probably. of it. And actually, I'm pretty sure he's read this. We can well. ask Carl. So I'm curious. Did you guys like this story, Rodrigo? I really did. Um, I think that um, obviously now I'm back to playing D&D, but I have always felt that it's I don't know it's it's hard to explain but there is more to fantasy than Tolkien mm -hmm. and people don't always understand that people every are furiously typing on their keyboards right now how dare you no exactly you know huge big life changing event cataclysm for World of Warcraft just came yes. out yes what what are the races in World of Warcraft dwarves elves orcs yep goblins goblins Monsters, you know D and D dragons. same thing um. You know, my one of my favorite role playing games is Exalted. Exalted doesn't have any of that stuff. It's mostly just Eastern stuff and a little bit of like Greek mythology mixed in. And I just loved this book in particular because I, like we said, I haven't read the other stuff mm -hmm. because it wasn't Tolkien. I mean, obviously there are influences there, but this right. is cowboys, this is guns and magic. Mm -hmm. It's just the fact that it kind of shuffles everything to the right mm -hmm. you know it's like okay well you have cowboys and magic just the exploration of what that means of what this society that's a little bit more advanced dealing with sorcery you know of, of kind of bringing more american mysticism into things and more eastern mysticism into things makes the whole stew a little bit better for me mm -hmm. um so just from the strength of the setting i also and the other thing that I really like is that, I, you know, I mentioned that some things are in here just to seem awesome. I find that a lot of it really appeals to my sort of somewhat underdeveloped hipster aesthetic, as some <laughs> things are clearly here to seem not cool. Like right. the fact that what we're looking for is a giant pink balloon. Right. You know, it's like how not awesome is mm -hmm. the fact that what you're looking for is an enormous marble, mm -hmm. you know? Like a pink one at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, you know, it, it just seemed really interesting to me. Like just all of the elements that got thrown in here, mm -hmm. just all, each one of them struck a particular chord with me to form a fantastic melody of blah blah blah. And I, <laughs> no, in the end, I kind of liked it. Yeah, it Matthew, what about you? Did you like this story? Did you like this this way that it was told? The introduction of the characters and the plot, how it moved from A to B to eventually Z. I like the story. I like the language and the words. I like the the implications of a greater reality and the little bits and pieces of like Egyptian mysticism and things that we don't understand about their culture. You know, you have forgotten the face of your father. Right. I liked all of that. Mm -hmm. Then there were the pictures. All right. Well, we'll get to the art in just a second. We'll get to the art in a second. But overall, the story you kind of <laughs> liked. You know, I I, gotta I, tell you. I liked it in that it was very engaging as yeah. a reality. There was a lot going on that it was easy, not necessarily easy to relate to, but it was something that you wanted to know about. It was a mystery in the right sense of the word. Mm -hmm. I, I think I I am not, and I've I think I've made it known to many people that I don't like Peter David. The mm -hmm. guy rubs me the wrong way. I don't care to read any of his stuff. If someone were to give me a choice between reading Peter David and Dan Slott or uh, um, um, Grant Joe, Morrison. Quesada, Joe, Joe Quesada or Grant Morrison, I'd probably pick all of those over Peter David. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that I've said before on this show, and I know I've said it many times on this show, is that when I read a book, I don't look at who yeah. it's written by because I don't follow authors. So I read through this, and knowing that it's coming from Stephen King, I was more interested in reading it, and I'm pleasantly surprised by the way the story moves. I thought there are parts where it is very cliched. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the whole scene where uh, they step into the bar, uh, and somebody pushes the gimp, and he spills the 
the tobacco juice on on one of the bad guy's boots, and he's ready to tell the kid to lick it off my boot till it's clean. Mm -hmm. And one of the good kids comes up and pulls a uh, BB gun or a knife on the guy's back and says, I don't think you're going to do it. Then another bad guy comes behind the kid and pulls a gun, his gun to his head, and then another good guy comes in and gun to his back. Bad guy comes in, gun to his back. Good guy comes in, gun. And it's just like, dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. It's like, where's the gag? You know, it's like, you actually wrote that into the story that way. And it's kind of a cool moment by about the third or fourth time that it happens. You're like, right. oh, my God, we get it. All right. And so that was kind of annoying. Um, the appeal to me was that this is a, in, as I mentioned a moment ago, that this is a post-apocalyptic society and what has happened to it. And so that's why it's engaging to me. Mm -hmm. um, I thought the words were okay. I thought the story moved along. Very cliched, predictable manner, but, you know, kind of overall, I still liked it. Now let's get to the art. Matthew, you don't care for the art. Yes. Why not? I don't care for... There are two things that I love. Every time we see Susan's face, uh huh. I love the art. I, I want to kiss the art, and I want to go, mwing, 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 art, I love you. <laughs> and when we get to Western things, the handling of guns and horses and bridles, and especially boots and those little cowboy gloves that cowboys always wear, love that. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the big empty color fill backgrounds and yeah. the places where they're standing on what appears to be, you know, what literally looks like the background from what's opera doc, where it's this enormous tree standing on nothing floating mm -hmm. in midair. And I know what they're going for. And I know that I should be looking at that and going, wow, you know, that is, but I'm just kind of like, no, it, it's it's not. It didn't gel for me in terms of just the visuals. Yeah, you know, the the art is not a a favorite of mine because I just don't like this style where it's the super high contrast where you're either completely filled in black shadow or you've got ping highlights all over your your body. That's one thing that I don't like about it. But I've mentioned before that I don't like um, images that are full of blank backgrounds and a lot of the washes that lee puts in here are just that an excuse not to put in detail mm -hmm. let's fog it up so that we don't have to see too far into the distance etc 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 there's also kind of a disgusting kind of an appeal uh yeah. in the art in the way that some of the faces are drawn especially people who are mutants but the thing that i find most disturbing and i think people have commented about lee's work and another thing that i'll mention in a moment is his uh environment you know the rocks all have this melty slimy look to them um and in the case of the wolverine goes to hell series that one cover it looks like wolverine's taking a big dump and that's a that's a lee cover yeah uh so when i look at the buildings and i look at the the rocks that that lee puts in this book i'm like bleh terrible but then you get to the part where they discover the oil fields and these tanks and you're suddenly going well maybe these rocks have all been melted because of some catastrophic catastrophic <laughs> event, be it a nuclear disaster or a uh, alien invasion or a meteor strike or whatever it may be, I can start to live with it a little bit at that point. Interesting. Rodrigo, art. Um, I, the, my one complaint about the art is that it's, it's oddly static. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, you, when, when I started learning about comic books and, you know, I kind of wanted to draw comics, what most people will tell you is don't show the moment before the punch right. show or even the actual punch show the moment after the punch when everything's already in motion kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And there are moments like that. But even flipping through the pages, it is kind of a lot of people just standing still. Yes. Um, a lot of pretty people standing still. And I don't mean that they are pretty people mm -hmm. along of a lot of like beautifully rendered people standing still right there is a lot of that that said i love this art i picked it up i picked up the the actual floppies the first three issues of this which mm -hmm. i never do mm -hmm. solely on the art i really like it i like i like it when the creepy spider king shows up 
and there are weird spiders coming out of his mouth, and I like the brambly trees, and I like the pretty girls, and I like the glowing things, and I like the weird pugs, and I like the ugly horses, <laughs> yeah, huh? and I like the good man's weird mask, and I like the little sheriff stars and things like that. Like, there's just a lot. It's kind of the same as the story itself for me. There's a lot of individual elements about it that I like, and it is enough to tip me over into liking it. Okay. Matthew, is there anything, I mean, you've kind of talked about the art already, but is there anything story-wise that you don't like? Is there something that you thought it was going to go one way and it didn't, or there was a stumbling in the story, or did it get drawn out too long? I mean, I think we're reading seven issues here in one book. Yeah. Issues one through seven. Could it have? Could we have trimmed it at issue and made it six? I don't necessarily know that the plot is the point. Um, with this series, it's really the journey that's important, not necessarily the destination. Because mm-hmm. I'm trying, you know, racking my brain for the particulars of the plot. And what it really breaks down to is this kid is going to be a good guy. He's a white hat. And he goes out into the world and he meets this beautiful woman and then black hats try to kill him and he has to do something smart. And in the end, he gets, you know, the giant boob. I think that (laughs) it's... You got the boob. It's not really... Yeah. It's not a story, really, so much as it's a vignette of a much larger, uh, an epic story, uh, you know, of, of Roland's life. And that, I think, is really what works for it. The particulars of this story are Roland meets the love of his life, bad people arrive, bad things happen, and he ends up finding the MacGuffin or one of the MacGuffins that will eventually, I think, turn him into something. Not sure. Into Wolverine. I understand that the ending is very... I understand that the ending of The Dark Tower is very Neon Genesis Evangelion, and you have to read a lot into it, and nobody's entirely sure of what in the Holy Mazanga happens at the end. Yeah. But I think that this arc is as long as it is. And as with, you know, what I tell people at work, they're like, well, what about my AHT? Well, a call is as long as it is. Just don't make it longer than it has to be. I never felt this story was longer than it had to be. But as you'll notice, there are what, seven more stories that came after this in comics and seven books of the book of the stories. And then maybe the universe reboots at the end. We're not sure, you know, This is like, this is someone telling you a story about some things that happened in this awesome world that make you want to read more about it. Rodrigo, bottom line. Bottom line, I really enjoy it. I've been picking up the um, each volume, not necessarily as it comes out, but more or less as my checks come in, and it's available in our... Um, fine, we'll fine say yes. Hastings. Yep, in our in our fine Hastings. Um, I'm a in big RB fan Dalton. of it. How you know it's? I, I like it. I I like it as as kind of a weird moment. I like that it's cool cowboys in a magic world doing cool things and looking awesome. There, at no point have I thought to myself, "Wow, I should really read the, the Dark Tower material. books." Mm-hmm. Because I kind of don't want to. In fact, like, as I look more into this, you know, I, I made the comment a little bit ago. I'm like, yeah, this guy clearly eventually becomes an awesome badass. But I like reading about characters who are not awesome badasses, who are fallible and have issues. So I'm I'm just fine with this. I, I actually like it a lot. Okay. I would say if you like fantasy and are tired of your pointy ear elf fantasy, <laughs> pick out, like, check out the Dark Tower, see if you like it. Matthew, same question, final thoughts. I think that this book is really valuable to three classes of people. Stephen King fans, Dark Tower fans, or people who are looking for something in a comic book that isn't you know your standard issue superhero. I was drawn in, I'll grant that, and I like the fact that the character is as well-rounded as he is, and I like the fact that even in this volume, he says and does things that are pretty much unconscionably bastardry. 
but he's our protagonist, not necessarily our hero, and that works for me. I would say definitely check it out. It's not something that I would wholeheartedly recommend as a you know super super winner every single time, but it works. It's not something that I'm going to go and seek out all of it and you know hoard it in my little uh, room full of comics necessarily. But it was a pleasant read. It was well done, and some of those women are just god awful pretty. Yeah, some of them are god awful ugly too. Yep. I will say this: the narrator of this book, if he wasn't already dead, would be Johnny Cash. <laughs> the man in black fled across the desert, and the gunslinger followed. I, th- I think his voice would just be awesome, 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 awesome. As and that's who I kept hearing as I read through this book. Mm-hmm. This is an interesting book. I would probably agree with Matthew that you have to kind of be in a certain mindset to read it. I really had little interest to read this book when Rodrigo suggested it, mainly because of the art and the writer. Mm-hmm. I did sit down. Read it, enjoyed it enough to go out and buy the second volume. I want to see what happens next. Mm-hmm. I want to see what happens to Roland after he's gone into his coma or been sucked into the the, the pink marble. Um, I, I want to see what happens next. Is it super great? Mm, it's not super great, but I think it's worth picking up and checking out if you fall into that category of, of uh, fantasy, mm-hmm. of a different kind of fantasy. So I'm going to give it a thumbs up in this case. So... There you go. The Dark Tower from Marvel Comics, The Gunslinger Born. Thank you, everyone, for checking out this week's episode of the Major Spoilers Podcast. Remember, if you would like to help us out, please head over to patreon.com slash major spoilers. That's where you can support us and everything that we do. Only a couple bucks a month to keep this show going. And of course, uh, if you want to give a little bit more, we've got some other benefits the higher up you go on that Patreon chain. We'll be back next week. Why? Because we know that you love comics and we do too. And we will talk with you soon. If I had the x-ray vision of a Superman, I could save a few bucks and stand around and read through the covers of the comics on the stand. But although every other page would be backwards, I suppose, I could still read the evens and the odds. Well, I don't know. Guess I haven't thought this all the way through. Plus, as soon as the comic book store guy knew, they kicked my butt out on the corner. What a major spoiler, what a major spoiler. When you think about a better way, if I was hulking green or gray, I could just bust through that brick wall, take their comic books away. But then the little meat would deal with all the tanks and bombs and guns. Have you ever tried to read a series with all that going on? Guess I need to rethink this plan. How would I back and board my comics with such huge hands? Guess I already told ya. What a major spoiler, what a major spoiler, yeah, 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 what a major spoiler, what a major spoiler. If I'm Stark Raven, it's like a man of iron, I might not be surprised to find that I might actually have the hard cold to follow an entire storyline. Would I really even need to read upon all those escapades? I mean, who needs such distractions when your sister's such a babe? But the downside is such a beast. Shot up in a fun be in the Middle East with a King Santo and soldier. What a major spoiler! What a major spoiler! Yeah, yeah, yeah! What a major spoiler! Whoa, 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 whoa! What a major spoiler! This podcast is copyright 2024 by Major Spoilers Entertainment LLC.